Hey class, welcome back. Hope you guys are all doing well today. Uh, this PowerPoint that we'll be looking at coming up is going to be discussing and examining uh, some of the battles uh, during the First World War. Now, I have done a, a lot of study on the First World War. I've taken specific uh, courses in uh, the First World War for my uh, bachelor's degree. And, um, and there, there is just so much. There's, there's, there's different uh, campaigns. You have uh, the Western Front. You have the Eastern Front. So the Western Front's with France, Eastern Front with, um, with Russia, and then there's the, even a Southern Front in the West, which is like kind of Italian Alps area. You have the Southern Front um, over by uh, uh, Turkey with the Gallipoli campaign, which we will talk about that for a little bit. You have uh, the Northern uh, Front, if you want to call it that, because you have the, the ocean up there north of Europe, uh, the North Sea. And, and there's, there's naval warfare battles going on. You have the African campaign where there's actually battles going on in the colonies in Africa. You have a war going on in, um, involving uh, uh, Australia and New Zealand, which they come up to the Gallipoli campaign. You have some things going on in the Pacific Ocean uh, because Japan wants to get in there. I mean, there is, there is world war going on with the First World War. So... There's different aspects of the war where you start looking at the battles and the different fronts and the campaigns. There's also a social aspect to it uh, where you have um, uh, things going on in England society because uh, you have the upper class who are, who are the aristocracy and then you have the lower class and, and there's the, these barriers being broken down uh, between the classes because what happens when, when all of these people leave uh, to go to... Um, to the war, you know, what happens in the society, what happens w w with women going into the workforce, There's just different things going on. Um, you have the suffering that takes place in Germany because all the men in Germany go to the front and they're fighting. Well, there's, there's suffering going on because they, they, there's blockades and there's not enough food and people, you know, women and children are starving. There's all kinds of things that are taking place all throughout um, the war. Unfortunately, we can't get into great detail on any of that uh, with just this um, introduction basically to the war. We will talk about in this lecture uh, a few of the battles as we look at the, the war years themselves. With the Gallipoli campaign in 1915, the uh, Battle of the Somme in uh, 1916, uh, 1917 and 18, there's some changes. The United States enters the war um, on the side of the Allies. So there's just um, a, lot, a lot to cover here in, uh, in this PowerPoint. Okay, students, we're going to now move into our PowerPoint lecture for the First World War, Part 2. So we left off last time with the assassination of the Archduke and all of the um, countries, uh, kind of the dominoes falling, and they're declaring war on each other. Uh, so in the fall of 1914, some things take place that also assisted in um, in the declarations of war and just kind of like the the news being spread of uh, of the Archduke being uh, killed. So it wasn't like the Archduke and his wife were killed and the next day war was declared. There was there was some you know about a month in there. So what what takes place? Well, the news of the war um, or the Assassination of the Archduke and then the declarations of war—they they spread like wildfire. It just, again, it was—they didn't have the internet, they didn't have uh, uh, the the news on TV. Uh, they had to rely on newspapers and and print, um, maybe telegraph, telegrams, things like that. But the news spread like wildfire uh, because of the new means of communication, um, especially. I mean, telegrams had been around since the 19th century, but the news just spread. Um, there was cheaply mass-produced newspapers and pamphlets, and so it, it was. It was definitely overnight that the the news had spread, um, and it fueled intense nationalism. You know, especially when it was the declarations of war, the the country really started getting behind the the military and men were joining up just like no tomorrow. 
uh, nationalism exploded. The people wanted to have their nation to be the most powerful, their nation to outshine the rest of the nations. Um, foreign policy stories were all over the newspaper. I mean, they, people really got into this. They, You may not think of that today, like uh, politics and policy and, and foreign relations. You know, sometimes people don't even pay attention to that today. But back then, that's what that is what was in the newspapers, and people, everybody was reading it. Even the lower classes, they were it was cheap; they could buy the newspaper, and the lower classes were mobilizing and and coming together and joining up. So here's some images of of a couple of newspapers uh, from the time: assassination may lead to war, war declared by Britain and France, England declares war. Just different headlines. Um, that would catch the people's attention, and they would they want to read read about it and what's going on, and I'm behind my country, and and I want to be do my part. Here's um, an image of some jubilation uh, when war was declared, and so this is in Germany when Germany declared war, and this is a very famous picture because of when you look at history, especially back during the early uh, times of photography how this image was captured and so you see all the people all the men they have their hats they have a lot of the same hats but they're, they're raising them up in the air like joyous that germany has declared war well wouldn't you know it right down here in this circle uh, is a person and it's blown up you may have seen this picture before in a book or something and so there he is this is adolf hitler adolf hitler was captured by in this photograph um, when Germany declared war, he's, he's all joyous, and he is going to go on and, and uh, fight in the war. He's going to fight for four years and survive, obviously. Okay, so news spread, and as we had left, left off, Austria declares war, and they want to destroy Serbia, basically. They want to invade and destroy Serbia, but they hold off because they're afraid of Russia. If they attack, Russia will come to the aid of Serbia and attack Austria-Hungary. Now, uh, it takes time to mobilize a military. And so Russia, didn't, they didn't have an army like just sitting there waiting to go into, into Austria-Hungary in case Austria-Hungary attacks Serbia. They it would take some time. So if they attacked, if, if Austria attacks Serbia, Russia would come to their aid. And so Austria is scared about that. If Austria is attacked by Russia, Germany would come to the aid of Austria-Hungary. So again, just kind of sort through that in your mind. Austria wants to destroy Serbia, but is afraid of Russia. If they attack Russia, if they attack, Russia will come to the aid of Serbia and attack Austria-Hungary. If Austria is attacked by Russia, Germany will come to Austria-Hungary's aid. So that's kind of like the minds, the, the fear mindset that's going on. July 5th, 1914, Germany gives Austria what is called the blank check. That's the actual name for it. It's called, it's called Germany's blank check. And what they basically said was whatever Austria chooses to do, Germany will come to their aid no matter what. So if Austria invades Serbia, Germany is going to help them out. Germany will be there for them. Even if Russia uh, you know, attacks, Germany is going to be there for them. German Emperor Wilhelm II, we already talked about him last lecture, was very angry because just two weeks before the assassination of Archduke Fer uh, Franz Ferdinand, he met with Archduke Ferdinand on his country estate to discuss the Balkan situation. And at this meeting, Wilhelm II and the Austrian Archduke became pals. They, you know, it, was, it was a good meeting. It was a good time at the country estate. You know, they're, they're nobility. They're upper class. They're very wealthy. And they have this, this meeting on the country estate, and it's a good time. Two weeks later, the Archduke is killed. And Emperor Wilhelm II, he's upset about this. He's very angry. So he says, Austria, here's your blank check. Without Germany's backing, the conflict may have been localized in the Balkan 
region, but Germany's backing would cause the alliances to act. Okay, so that blank check was very important. When you do a more detailed study of this, it looks like it could have been localized just within the Bosnian Serbian area. Okay, they could have been basically just been a localized conflict. But because Germany gave a blank check and Austria decides they're going to act, it actually led to a world war. Okay, mobilization. Again, as I said, they had they had a lot of military might, but that doesn't mean they had millions and millions and millions of men in their army yet. These countries had to mobilize their forces. The declarations of war and the mobilization of militaries caused great alarm in Germany because Germany would have to fight a war on two fronts. That's the price you pay for giving a blank check. They would have to fight a war on the Russian front and on the French front, known as the Eastern Front and the Western Front. So what happens is France mobilizes their military based on a plan, and their plan is called Plan 17. And what this plan did, it allowed for attacking maneuvers against Germany, but the plan did not, did not plan for the number of casualties that may, may occur. And so what happens is Germany declares war on France. Okay, so the way, the way the plan would work is if France began to mobilize based on Plan 17, Germany would be forced to mobilize against France first based on their plan called the Schlieffen Plan, which we're going to look at next. Germany diplomatically attempts to get Russia to stop its mobilization. Okay, so Germany wants to act against France first, knowing that Russia on the Eastern Front is going to mobilize. So Germany tries to get them to stop diplomatically, but Russia refuses. So Germany declares war on Russia. So now they're definitely going to have a two-front war. And so Germany has to put in place their best plan. Okay, so here is France's Plan 17. And you can see, uh, I got my cursor up there again. Uh, this is France, up here's Belgium, here's France, and here's Germany. And Plan 17 is these army groups right here are going to attack into Germany. Okay, that's Plan 17. Here's Alsace. Remember I had mentioned about Alsace-Lorraine? Here's Alsace. This is Luxembourg. This is Belgium. So that's France's Plan 17. And they didn't take into account how many casualties there were going to be because there would be great casualties. Okay, so next, that's Plan 17 for France. Next is the Schlieffen Plan of Germany. To deal with a two-front war, Germany relied on a plan that was developed in 1905 by General Alfred von Schlieffen. And you can see his dates, 1833 to 1913, he would die before his plan was even put into place. But this is how they would deal with a two-front war. Number one, Germany would attack France through neutral Belgium in the west and defre defeat France quickly. Now this plan counted on a slow mobilization of Russia, of their forces in Russia. So if they defeat France quickly, then Germany can swing their army all the way to the east again and defeat Russia. But here's the problem. Germany would need permission to move through neutral Belgium. Guess what? Belgium's not going to have it. Number two, movement of 180,000 soldiers to France required huge logistical issue. 
and then they would have to move them all the way to the east again to attack Russia. Now that 180,000 soldiers is in the plan, but in reality, they're going to move a lot more soldiers into France because of what Belgium does. All right, so keep that in your mind. Schlieffen Plan Part 1. You can see on the map, you have your German forces here in Germany along these lines. You can watch my cursor. And it's basically these big swinging movements that are going to happen. They're going to move through Belgium, move through Luxembourg also, move through them. Now they're, they're neutral. And they're going to swing around here, cutting off any kind of attempt for uh, England to come help, cutting them off, swinging down, taking Paris, defeating France. That's part one. And this is going to be a really quick movement. That's the plan, a real quick movement. And then, after they defeat Paris and defeat France, then they're going to swing all of their forces over to the Eastern Front. You see this big fat arrow all the way over to the Eastern Front to meet the Russian aggression on the Eastern Front. This is a massive logistical issue because you're moving massive amounts of armies, men, equipment, all of this. You're doing it by railway, so you have to take all their railways and all that, move all the way around and come back to Russia to fight them. The issue is Belgium. They're neutral and they will not give permission to go through Belgium. Early days of World War I. Germany asks Belgium to move their army freely through Belgium to attack France. Belgium refuses. They refuse on the very same day that Germany declares war on France. So Germany had talked to Belgium before the declaration of war and they gave them a time period. They gave them an ultimatum. You have like 24 hours to do this. Belgium refuses. Germany doesn't care. Germany invades anyway. They go into Belgium and they go into tiny Luxembourg and they're going on their way to France. But here's the deal. Remember, speed is the key for part one of the Schlieffen plan because Russia is going to be mobilizing. So part one, invade France, beat them. Here's the problem. Immediately there are problems for Germany. Belgium mobilizes 20% of their male population, which is 350,000 men. So instead of going through neutral country, now Germany has to face 350,000 men in Belgium. Belgium stations these men in a belt of strong fortresses that were built in the 19th century. And there was a strategic layout for these fortresses and we'll see a map in a second. So Germany is going to run into these Belgium forts. 600,000 Germans, okay, so don't forget that 180,000 Germans. 600,000 Germans are hindered for 10 days at Liege, Belgium. That 10 days is critical because in the meantime, as they're being slowed up by the Belgians, Belgians, Russia has mobilized and they're bringing their forces against Germany on the Eastern Front. So here's a photograph of German soldiers moving into Belgium. They obviously haven't met the Belgians yet at their forts. This is one of the earliest photographs of World War I. Early days of World War I. Germany needs to use massive artillery to break these fortresses. Okay, so the Germans are coming across. Okay, and you can start seeing, you start seeing these these blue, uh, blue dots here. There's red dots and then blue. These are the fortresses, okay, that are set up. And then you have these ring of fortresses around these cities. 
and usually the cities are the crossroads where the railways were run through. Remember, they required the logistics of railways to move their soldiers for the Schlieffen plan to work. So they had to take these cities to have the railways. Well, to take the city, they had to take the forts. Well, these forts are heavily fortified, and they have a lot of Belgian soldiers in them. And so these forts hinder the German speed. To, to break these forts, they had to bring in a lot of artillery, which takes time to bring in and set up. Well, some of these forts were so massive that the Germans needed to bring in big artillery to blast the forts. And they had to bring in these guns called, they were nicknamed Big Berthas. And they were Krupp. Krupp is a um, factory in Germany that made armaments. The Krupp factories and and they still exist today they don't make guns anymore but the Krupp factories they manufactured these big Berthas and it was a 47 ton howitzer that shot a 16.5 inch shell that means the barrel the hole in the barrel that uh, the the projectile will come out of is 16.5 inches across so it's a big gun the shell weighed 1807 pounds so just massive the only way you could you could transport this thing was by railroad so it takes time for this to happen so the belgians stopped the germans at these forts the germans need to bring in big guns on railway it takes so much time in the meantime russia is mobilizing on the eastern front uh, there's a picture of big bertha uh, one of them just see how, how many men it takes to, to, to operate this thing. It's on a railway. It's set it up. I mean, just a huge... The, the hole in this barrel is 16 and a half inches across. So just a huge gun. Continuing with the gallant... Or the early days of World War I. Gallant Little Belgium. That was the nickname given to Belgium. At these forts, they held the Germans at bay. Okay, which gave time for Russia to mobilize, which gave more time for France to be prepared. The Germans then turn on the Belgian population. They basically went to, they were going to punish the German population, excuse me, the Belgian population for not giving them the, the free access through the country. And there's an event called what is called the Rape of Belgium. And this is where the Germans basically just just go crazy. They execute Belgians. They rape women. They kill children. I mean, it's just atrocities committed by the Germans as they move through Belgium. Britain declares war because of the invasion of Belgium. And little Belgium held out, allowing France to have a better footing. Okay, and so there's a propaganda picture of uh, this big, bulky German with his Piccolob helmet on, and he's got his sword, and he's got this German girl by the nape of the neck with his uh, bloody sword. So you see these pictures in England, you see these pictures in France, and it's like we have got to come to the aid and stop these brutes. Um, here's uh, execution of some civilians in Belgium. Okay, so now in the early days, uh, Germany finally defeats Belgium and they move into France. Okay, so Germany moves through Belgium into France, but has to defer, divert some soldiers east to stop the Russians who have now begun to invade Germany on the Eastern Front. And we're not going to have time to get into the Eastern Front warfare because there's, uh, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, battles on the Eastern Front. The Eastern Front was a lot more mobile. The battles were, um, because there's, it's more of like uh, horse cavalry against cavalry type thing, the, the, the battles were a lot more uh, mobile in the Eastern Front, but we're not going to talk much about the Eastern Front. They move through on the Western Front. 
They meet the French and the British expeditionary force, the BEF, the British, at the Battle of the Marne River. It's called the Battle of the Marne. There will be several Battles of the Marne. But they meet at the First Battle of the Marne on September 6th to the 10th, 1914. It was mostly French. There were six French army groups and one British army group. Again, the British were still mobilizing on, on the island of England, and they're still trying to um, get their armies together. But the French and the British meet at the, at the Marne River to fight against the Germans, and here's the numbers. 1.4 million Germans versus 1 million French and British. Massive numbers of people. And this is just the beginning. It's an Allied victory, and they stopped the Germans 30 miles from Paris, which was a great feat to stop them because if the Germans captured Paris, they probably would, France probably would have fallen. But they stop the Germans 30 miles from Paris. Here's the result. This is important. Have a drink of coffee. Here's the result. It ruined the Schlieffen plan. The plan that Germany was counting on is done. It ruined the plan. So there's no quick victory over, Par uh, over France. And what happens is the war delves into trench warfare. Because they, the, the Germans were stopped and they basically come to a, a stopping point 30 miles from Paris, which the both armies then entrench. This entrenchment leads to what is called the race to the sea. Allies, the Allied forces, which is the French and the BEF, the British, they battle with the Germans in kind of like a leapfrogging battle movement to the north. So they're basically moving north, battling one another, and digging trenches the whole way. They also do this to the south, down towards Switzerland. But the race of the sea goes to the north, and they're entrenching the entire way. And what this does, this develops into what is known as the Western Front, where the war is going to be fought for four years along this front, with very little movement. A lot of stagnation, very little movement along this trench system called the Western Front. The trench system from the English Channel to Switzerland is known in the Western Front. I'm going to, this is the race to the sea. And what happens is there's these leapfrogging, notice my cursor, leapfrogging battles the whole way. And they're digging in and, and fortifying these trenches. And they keep going this way and this way and this way and this way. And they end up having this trench system all the way from the North Sea all the way down through all the way to Switzerland. World War I was supposed to be over by Christmas. All the armies thought this. The Germans thought we would win by Christmas. The English thought we win by Christmas. The French thought we win by Christmas. And really what happens is by Christmas 1914, it has has solidified into a trench warfare system that will leave it basically lead to four years of massive death and war atrocity on the Western Front. Okay, now we are not going to be able to have time to talk about the many, many battles that take place. Each year of the war, 1914, 15, 16, 17, 18, <clears throat> all these years they have many, many battles all throughout. <clears throat> but we do want to talk about a couple of the big ones. <clears throat> By Christmas 1914, the Western Front had kind of solidified down into trench warfare. And the future of the war looked like how can we break this stalemate that's what basically the the strategy was we have to break the stalemate well one of the ways they wanted to break the stalemate England came up with this idea of invading the Ottoman Empire in the south and it's called the Gallipoli campaign 
1915. It was from February 1915 to January 1916. And I'll show a map here in a minute. But it takes place in uh, on the Gallipoli Peninsula, which is modern-day Turkey. Britain, France, and Russia decided we are going to weaken the Ottoman Empire. And you may ask, well, how did they pop in here, the Ottoman Empire? What happened was they secretly allied themselves with Germany at the beginning of the war. It was a secret alliance that takes place. And the Ottoman Empire, which is fairly large, is now part of the Central Powers. And they are south of Russia. And so if Britain decides to attack down there, it will draw forces from the Central Powers, hoping to draw them from the Western Front down into the Gallipoli Peninsula, down to now, now kind of like, it's almost like starting like a Southern Front. And if we draw the forces away from the Western Front down into the Southern part with, in Gallipoli, then it will weaken Germany and Austria's Western Front. So if they can take control of the Straits, they would have better position to also supply Russia because Russia is the ally of, of the British. And if they can take the strait that is near the Gallipoli Peninsula, which is called the Strait of Dardanelles, they can better supply Russia, which will help to uh, fortify or go against the Eastern Front of Germany and Russia fighting. Okay, So the Gallipoli Peninsula campaign was an amphibious landing on Gallipoli, but unfortunately that stagnates into trench warfare on the peninsula. In January of 1916, eight months after the fighting, there was no gain of land. The campaign was actually abandoned and the invasion force withdrawn. And really, it was a complete waste because there were 250,000 casualties on each side. On the Central power side, which was the Ottomans, 250,000 casualties, and on the Allies' side. Now, the Allies' side was mostly, it was British, but there were also a lot of Australians and New Zealands. New Zealanders. They came from Aust Australia and New Zealand to fight this, uh, this battle on Gallipoli. And the thing was, there was this massive mobilization in Australia and New Zealand. These guys, these soldiers, they were called Anzacs. A-N-Z-A-C, which was basically the Australian and New Zealand Army Corps. Basically, they got on ships. After they were mobilized and trained in Australia, they got on ships. They sailed from Australia up into the Mediterranean, okay, into the where the peninsula was. They got off the ships and went to war and ended up into trench warfare. A lot of these guys were killed. A lot of Anzacs were killed. And it led to a very costly defeat for the Allies. Now, one of the interesting points about the Gallipoli campaign was that a very famous young person, soldier, um, politician, he was in charge of this because he was the first Lord of the Admiralty in England, and his name was Winston Churchill. He was the first Lord of the Admiralty during World War I, and he helped plan the Gallipoli campaign, which was a disaster. It cost. It was a costly defeat of the Allies. Obviously, Winston Churchill would become um, have great prominence in the Second World War because he was Prime Minister of England uh, during the Second World War. Okay, so here is uh, some map for the Gallipoli campaign. So you see, up here is Europe, and the Western Front is right here. Okay, so this is the Western Front. This over here would be the Eastern Front, where Russia is fighting Germany. So you have 
Great Britain and France fighting Germany and Austria over here. Here we have Russia fighting Germany and Austria over here. Well, what they do is they come into the Mediterranean Sea and they come up here. And there's this little tiny waterway here. This is called the Strait of Dardanelles. And this little tiny land peninsula, this little tiny green piece where my arrow is, that is called Gallipoli. That's the Gallipoli Peninsula. And so the hope is, this is the Ottoman Empire, if they can take control of this, they take control of the peninsula, then they'll control the Strait of Dardanelles, and that way, if they can take control of this area, they can supply Russia through here, through the Black Sea. They can bring supplies through the strait, through this little waterway here, into the Black Sea and help supply Russia. So the whole point of Gallipoli was if we attack down here, it will draw German and Austrian forces down this way. And it will draw some German and Austrian forces away from this way to fight down here. When we win, we can then also supply Russia to help fight over here. And that strengthening of Russia may cause more Germans to leave the Western Front and come over here. Okay, which means then we can break through over here in the West. You can just see it's a it's a very ambitious plan to draw try to draw all these forces. Long story short, it doesn't work. Okay, so here's a blow up of that. So we have this is the Strait of Dardanelles, Istanbul here. Okay. which this is all Ottoman Empire. Here's the Gallipoli Peninsula. This is where they're going to invade, right down here on the tip. So here's the invasion of Gallipoli, an art artistic print. Most of these soldiers have just sailed from, from Australia. I mean, so they've been on ships for a long time. They get there. They're anchored off the Gallipoli Peninsula. These are... Basically, they're Turks, they're Ottomans, but they're, it's, the Turk, it's Turkey. The Turks control this. So they're up here on the, mount, on, the, on the cliffs and on the hills. They're being bombarded. The British, Australians, and New Zealanders are all landing here under fire to, to take the land. And it turns into trench warfare on the Gallipoli Peninsula. So you can see... They're in the trenches here. Okay, which again, as I've said, it it turns into a stalemate. And after months and months and months, the British, Australians, and New Zealanders, they leave, and guess where they go? They go to the Western Front in France. So after fighting on Gallipoli for all these months, the survivors, these, these veterans of Gallipoli, they're then moved to France. And they get there in 1916. Well, in 1916, there's another very ambitious plan by the British, by the Allies, called the Somme Campaign, the Battle of the Somme. And that's what we're going to talk about next. In 1916, we have the Battle of the Somme, which lasts from July 1st to November 18th, 1916. And some of these soldiers, they fought on Gallipoli. The Battle of the Somme is a massive frontal assault by the British and French against entrenched Germans along a 20-mile front in the Somme River Valley. Okay, so in northern France, there's the Somme River. And the plan is to have this big, massive push with, I mean, so many soldiers are going to leave their trenches, go across no man's land, which is the area between the trenches, and between the, the British trenches, British French trenches, and the German trenches, they're going to cross no man's land. They're going to punch through the Germans' lines real fast and then be able to you know, take advantage of that and exploit the, and attack the rear of Germany, German forces, and, and be able to um, basically gain a lot of territory and maybe even bring Germany to its knees. It's supposed to be a quick punch. Unfortunately, 
it ends in a bloody massacre in no man's land. It is, just, it is, they did not punch through anything and it just led a bunch of British to the slaughter. Here's the key thing about the Battle of the Somme. It is the deadliest battle for the British army in history. It was the deadliest day for the British army in history. The first day of the Battle of the Somme, when the, the captains of all of these companies in the trenches, when they blew their whistles and they went over the top, 20,000 British soldiers were killed in one day. I mean, you just think about that. How many men were killed every single minute? I mean, every second. They went over the lawn, over the top of the trench along this 20-mile front, and they faced machine guns, and they were just mowed down. 20,000 dead in one day. 57,000 were wounded in one day. I mean, just a massive amount of soldiers became casualties. Uh, there's a picture. It's kind of blurry, but there's a picture of uh, a trench, and there's dead, dead soldiers all around. They came out of their trench and were killed. Okay, so that was the Battle of the Somme. Um, <clears throat> 1917, the United States joins the war. A couple, uh, two big things happened in 1917. The first, the United States joins the war, and second, Russia leaves the war. Okay, so 1917, the United States joins the war. Uh, Germany had been conducting unrestricted submarine warfare in the Atlantic with, um, with their submarines, and they were actually sinking American ships. And this one American ship was sunk. It caused a lot of, a lot of civilians to die. And so finally, the United States, who was remaining neutral, they decide to join the war. Also, there was this event called the Zimmerman Telegram. And the Zimmerman Telegram was intercepted uh, by the Americans, which outlined a, an alliance between Germany and Mexico, where Germany was trying to get Mexico to, um, to attack the southern border of the United States. It didn't lead to any, anywhere. That it, it didn't happen. Uh, but there was this telegram that was intercepted. So finally, the United States decides we're going to join the war. President Woodrow Wilson leads America into the war. And this is the, this is the boost that the Europeans needed. By 1917, it was clear that this had become a war of attrition. It was just... One country slugging it out with another country, killing. I mean, so many men were being killed in the trenches and on no man's no man's land, and these these pointless assaults of going against one another, being mowed down by machine guns. Well, basically, what was happening? Great Britain was running out of men, France was running out of men, Germany was running out of men, and so America joining the war really boosted the Allies. Uh, Allies forces. So obviously they joined the Allies, the Great Britain and France. They joined them and they went over to France with fresh troops. And so there was a song um, called Over There that became very famous um, about the Americans coming or, or I, should, I should say going over there to um, Europe. And also um, you may have heard of the word doughboys. Uh, U.S. soldiers were called doughboys, and there's, it's kind of um, mysterious where this term came from because the term actually originated with uh, in the Civil War. Uh, and usually, it's attributed to the Civil War soldiers eating um, hardtack uh, biscuits, like they would make this dough that they would make into biscuits. Well, it was used in World War I, they were called doughboys, and a lot of times it's attributed to the donuts that the Red Cross would give to the um, American soldiers and the British and all that. So they were called doughboys. And there's a picture of one there on the right. <clears throat> 1917 and 18, again, I had mentioned um, the Russians would leave the war. In 1917, there's a revolution in Russia, um, Russian Revolution. 
Russia pulls out of the war, abolishes the Tsar. This is the time period of Rasputin. Um, we're not going to go into him, but Rasputin is there and in Russia. Well, this actually gives a boost to Germany and because it's no longer a two-front war. Russia pulls out. They stop fighting. And so Germany is able to move their forces from the Eastern Front over to the Western Front. Gives them a little bit of a boost. They do a, this uh, spring offensive um, in the spring of, of 19... Um, let's see, 17, 1918, I think it is, is the spring offensive. But it's not important. But they, they do this like spring offensive. But it's too little, too late. They're not able to um, really exploit that. And Germany is basically just running out of soldiers, running out of supplies. So many men have been killed. Um, there are many battles and engagements with the Americans, but the American military power and might is just too great. The war begins to drag on into 1918. Germany knows it's losing. Everyone knows that Germany is losing. Austria is just like almost non-existent now because they're they're now completely, um, you know, they they've run out of men. But it just the, the end is in sight. But they just keep grinding away at the Western Front, doing these pointless attacks. But finally. There is a plan for an armistice, which is a, um, an end to the fighting until a treaty can be drawn up. And at 11 a.m. on the 11th day of the 11th month of 1918, so on November 11th, 1918, the war stops. And it is all quiet on the Western Front. Four years of war and artillery and death comes to an end at that time which that actually becomes that date November 11th that date becomes Veterans Day in the United States the 11th 11 a.m. on the 11th day of the 11th month of 1918 okay so we're, we'll talk about the post-war happenings in the next PowerPoint but what I want to talk about to finish this up is um, First World War warfare and basically it, it's summed up with this. It's old war tactics in modern warfare. There's a lot of innovations that take place during World War I and the um, evolution of warfare to being a modern modern war, but the tactics that the commanders used were old war tactics, where it was basically you know, these big armies, and if we just send our soldiers against the big armies, we'll defeat them and we'll win. Well, that's, that's old-style warfare because the modern warfare had these, these innovations such as the machine gun or ga poison gas. And so if you just send your armies out against machine guns, well, they're going to be mowed down like grass. And that's what took place. Old war tactics in modern warfare equals massive casualties. So we're going to go through, just briefly explain each one of these, and then I have some pictures coming up. Um, Number one, trench warfare. That's a modern uh, tactic. It's not. It's not. World War One was not the first war that had trenches, but it was definitely the first global war that used trench warfare. Western Front it had it. Even the Eastern Front it had some. We saw Gallipoli campaign in the South and that had it. There was trenches everywhere. Barbed wire. That was put in no man's land to tangle up the troops. And it was just so much barbed wire used in no man's land. Some of it were just massive fields of barbed wire. They would put barbed wire over the top of some trenches so that when the enemy would be charging across no man's land, if they made it to the next trench, if they made it to the enemy trench, they couldn't get in because there was barbed wire all over it. Uh, the machine gun, I mentioned that already, just soldiers charging across no man's land being mowed down by belt fed machine guns poison gas soldiers just sitting in their trenches and gas would come across no man's land usually they would have to depend on the the winds the the wind movement to make sure it's being blown the right way you don't want your gas coming back on yourself so the the gas had to be going across so if there was if there was favorable winds they would release gas Poison gas, which would be like mustard gas, which was a yellowish color, or chlorine gas, 
and that would just it would, it would kill people. Mustard gas would cause the lungs to um, to rupture. You would basically bleed inside your lungs, and you would drown to death on your own blood. Uh, Flamethrowers were new. Tanks were new. I mean, these these big, you know, Goliath type tanks would come across no man's land. And this was later on in the war. Tanks were developed later on in the war. Uh, the development of the airplane, where you had first was air reconnaissance, so you could see where the enemy was. But then second was actual air combat, where you might hear you know the Red Baron where you had these biplanes fighting each other in the skies. Um, primitive bombings, where the planes would go over trenches and bomb. Some There were these uh, German bombers that would go over London. They actually bombed London. There were uh, submarines, like I mentioned earlier. Submarine warfare was uh, beginning in World War I, and they would be sinking ships and just submarine uh, tactics. Uh, Zeppelins or hot air balloons. Zeppelins were rigid airships. They actually had a frame to them uh, that they could go over and with reconnaissance or bombings. And, and again, they would bomb London with Zeppelins. There were hot air balloons that would go up and and focus on um, taking pictures and, and seeing where the enemy was. But the, the hot air balloons were easy targets for uh, the aircraft. So if someone went up in a hot air balloon to take pictures, the aircraft would come in and try to shoot at the hot air balloons. And then just the idea of total war, where total war is a movement of putting everything of your um, nation into the war footing. So the economy, the um, industry, the people, everything went to fight the war. And so there was total war in World War I. It would also happen again in World War II total war. A good example of this is that instead of making um, automobiles, again, automobiles were new at this time in the early 20th century, instead of making automobiles for people to go and just drive around in, everything would be going towards the development of, of war um, machines, trucks and tanks and all of that. So just total war. Okay, so um, we're going to talk about some of these things. The first I want to talk about is trench warfare. Uh, trench warfare is a type of land warfare using occupied fighting lines consisting of trenches or trench systems that protect soldiers from enemy small arms and artillery artillery fire. Now, the trenches of World War One were um, were not pleasant. Uh, they had basically moved underground. The men moved underground. They got they lived in the trenches. They had um, you know, kitchens in the trenches, latrines in the trenches, uh, dugouts for where the the captain would be with the the the, ca um, the company headquarters would be like in this dugout, which would be even deeper in the ground. Uh, some of them were quite elaborate, but it was still just a dirty, muddy, diseased, ridden place. There was lice, there were rats. I mean, just not a good place to be. Uh, there was a sickness that came about called trench foot and trench foot was the name given to um, when someone had rotting flesh and it basically was rotting of waterlogged flesh mainly of the feet because there was standing water in some of the trenches with no drying of the feet and a lot of this was in the allies side the British the French the Americans their trenches were not in a good place when the stagnation of trench warfare kind of solidified down into the trench system with no man's land in between the Germans had better um, a better area they had more of the higher ground some of their trench systems were in soil that was good for drainage or was actually chalky soil so they could actually kind of carve out their trenches but the British on the other hand or the Allies, they had lower ground. A lot of times they were in valleys, and so the water would collect there. And so their trench systems would have water in them. They would have to have duck boards on the bottom of their trench system to be able to stand in so they weren't standing in water all the time. But a lot of times it was muddy and dirty and just a lot of water. So here's a, uh, just an image of a trench system. 
so what we're going to do is we're going to look at here. Over here is no man's land where the my cursor is. And so the bad guy or the enemy would be over on this side. Okay, so here's no man's land. So you have a front line trench, and they would have them, these would be jutted like this. So in case, um, in case a bad guy or an enemy jumped into your trench, they wouldn't be able to take a machine gun and just shoot straight down the trench and just kill everybody. There are these, these jagged kind of uh, alternating walls and movements so that um, the machine gun wouldn't be able to shoot down straight down a trench. So that's what that was for. Uh, this is a forward listening post, an LP, which is they would dig out into no man's land and put somebody out there to listen. Okay. Then that's the front line trench. Then you had a support trench in the back, and that would have a communication trench. How would you get up to the front line? You have to go through this kind of a trench. You wouldn't jump up here because you might get shot. So they would move through that. So this is a support trench. And this is where the second line would be. So there would be guys back here. Up here would be the guys like maybe shooting or fighting or holding the line. These guys back here can take it easy a little bit. Maybe this is where medical is, um, that sort of a thing. These, this is where you would stage to go up to the front. And then you actually had another line, which would be the, through this reserve trench, and that would be back here. And you had... Uh, another line of trenches that would connect them to a reserve trench so this would be where uh, these guys are not doing the fighting but they're holding their you know they're they're here in case for if they need need uh, more s support or reinforcements they could come up from a reserve trench would be back here and then as i said there'd be a company headquarters where this would be the captain would be he'd have his desk his planning table um usually a little deeper in the ground. So there's some steps going down into an underground. Maybe his bed would be here. So his company would be up here, but he would be back here um, with the planning. Okay, so that's uh, um, a diagram of trench warfare. Here's some pictures, some guys going over the top. This guy here is in a waterlogged trench. So you can see if, if you can't get out of the trench and you're in this water, your feet are going to start to rot. So there's that guy. Uh, this is a, these are some Germans, and they went hunting, and they were able to kill some rats that were in their trench. Those are some pretty big rats. I wouldn't want that thing crawling on me at night. Uh, machine gun. So again, these are Germans. You can see with the pickle log helmet on with covers. They have actually fabric covers over their helmets. So again, if you're a, a British and you're running across no man's land, this is what you're facing. You're facing this machine gun shooting at you. And they were just like being mowed down. Just a lot of guys being killed by machine guns. Complete waste. Uh, here's uh, gas attacks. So this is early gas attack uh, where... Basically, they had these gas canisters, and the, the wind would definitely have to be right for the gas to go across no man's land to the, the British trenches. These are Germans. Um, later on, they actually had gas shells, artillery shells, that would they would shoot these shells over into um, the British trenches. The shells would explode, but instead of exploding with a lot of uh, shrapnel that would kill a bunch of men, it would explode and gas would come out. Here's a German uh, gas masks, and they even have one for their horse. Or they stuck one on their horse, I should say. Here's a drawing of the flamethrower. So again, if you're running across no man's land and you made it to the German trench, you got to face this. You got to face a bunch of flames being thrown at you. Uh, here's a tank. This is a British tank. Okay. They were called the Mark tank, M-A-R-K. They had numbers after them, Mark 7 or something. So this is a British tank. It was designed to be able to get over trenches. So these guys are taking a ride. Uh, this is a German tank. Uh, these are British, looks like British officers. But... Uh, this is, a, I guess, a captured German tank. So you can see their tank was a little bit different in design. 
But again, this was new. And so if so, if you were a, a soldier in a trench and this big thing is like coming at you and shooting and have machine guns, these uh, these windows would be you know machine guns shooting out of it. You know, it would be terrifying. Uh, an airplane, kind of a biplane. I could have had a better picture than this, but I want to, what I wanted to show you was this is a very famous man. Uh, this is a German, and his name is Hermann Göring, and he was a fighting ace in World War One. He he shot down a lot of the Allied uh, airplanes. Uh, uh, Hermann Göring, Hermann Göring would go on to become the commander of the Luftwaffe in World War Two, and he became second in command to uh, Adolf Hitler. He became a very good friend of Hitler in the very beginning of the of the Nazi movement, and he would become the commander of the Luftwaffe, which was the German Air Force in World War II. So that's Hermann Göring as a young man. During World War II, he was actually quite fat. He became a very fat man in World War II. And to finish out our PowerPoint lecture here, uh, this is a, another uh, pretty famous photograph because who's in it? This is um, an early picture of Adolf Hitler. Uh, he was a runner in World War I. He fought in World War I from 1914 to 1918. He um, survived the war, obviously, which was very rare that you would live all four years because so many men were killed. Um, he was wounded. He was gassed. In fact, when World War I ended, he was in the hospital because he was blinded by gas, which would wear off. Which, um, if you read, if you ever read the book Mein Kampf, which Hitler wrote after World War One, he um, Mein Kampf means my struggle. He writes about his World War One experience and how he was in the hospital when the war ended. And when he heard that the war ended, he just sobbed and sobbed because he was so upset that Germany lost. But that's, uh, that's Adolf Hitler there. He doesn't have his little mustache yet. He still has a pretty big mustache, which was of the times. But that was Hitler in World War I. He would end the war as a corporal because um, of his heroics. He would, get, uh, he would have the Iron Cross, though he would have the wound badge. So in his own right, he, um, he was kind of a... A brave soldier, you know. We don't want to like. We don't want to think about Adolf Hitler in any good terms, but he went to war for his country. Again, the Nazis did not exist yet, but he went to war just like so many other Germans did, and uh, uh, he fought for Germany. And he was actually Austrian because he was born in Austria, but he fought for Germany and survived and was awarded the Iron Cross. So that's Adolf Hitler. And that's it for our second lecture, uh, PowerPoint lecture for war, First World War. I'll see you in a second. All right, class, that's, uh, that's enough. I mean, we, we could go on and on and on and talk about these different uh, aspects of the First World War and the things that take place during different war years and, war years and, the, and the different battles that take place. I mean, the Battle of the Somme is is one of the big ones, but there's a lot of different ones. There's, there's the battle. Uh, there's several. There's actually several battles in um, in Ypres, uh, Belgium. There's there's several battles in uh, uh, you know, Passchendaele, uh, Verdun. I mean, these are these are some big battles that we just can't uh, that we just can't, don't have the time uh, to get into. And also, I didn't talk a lot about the leadership of these um, uh, these countries. I mean, there's there's definitely uh, important leaders uh, during the First World War. In, in Britain, in Great Britain, and in Germany, you know, there's Hindenburg, there's um, um, Kitchener in, war, in Great Britain during World War One, just uh, different leaders. We just don't have the time uh, to talk about them. Uh, one thing I did touch on uh, just just briefly there was uh, some of the, you know, you saw Goering, Hermann Goering, with that airplane picture. You saw obviously Adolf Hitler uh, there as a young man in World War One. World War One. Uh, produces, especially in Germany, uh, some in some in in Great Britain and France, but especially in Germany, uh, produces the leaders of the Second World War. Obviously, Hitler is going to become uh, the Führer uh, during the Second World War, uh, but Goering, he's in charge of the Luftwaffe. 
during the Second World War. And if, as you start looking at the actual leaders of the Nazi movement, uh, the military machine during the Second World War, um, you really um, you really start to see um, these guys, you know, cutting their teeth on warfare in the First World War that prepares them for the Second World War. Another good example is um, is Erwin Rommel. He was a uh, in the infantry during the First World War. He actually wrote a book called Infantry Attacks that. Um, he later becomes uh, a really important guy during the Second World War, especially during the African campaign with the Africa Corps. He was the leader of the, Africa, the German Africa Corps. His name was Erwin Rommel. These guys, they all cut their teeth on warfare in the First World War. Germany loses, and then as they start to um, uh, regain you know, their standing, especially with the Nazi movement, uh, these guys really start to collect together and become the leaders of the Nazi movement and then, and then of Germany during the Second World War. So it's such a very important time uh, for, uh, for Germany, for Europe. So uh, other than that, um, next time we're going to be looking at uh, the post-war, kind of like the peace movement. It's not a very long lecture. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on that. Uh, but the, the peace movement after the Second World War, sorry, the First World War, and, uh, and, and how Europe kind of comes to peace for a short amount of time um, before the Second World War. Okay, other than that, have a great day.